national news. You're walking on the street, you're not littering, you're not jaywalking, you're not even spitting on the sidewalk, but a police officer spots you and thinks something is suspicious. And the next thing you know, you're being stopped, questioned, and frisked. That's been a reality for years in New York City. Well, for years in New York City, in parts of New York City. You don't see a ton of it happening on, say, Fifth Avenue. The police target high crime areas. But that has to now change because a federal judge yesterday declared the policy unconstitutional. Specifically, the ruling states, quote, the city adopted a policy of indirect racial profiling by targeting racially defined groups for stops based on local crime suspect data. This has resulted in the disproportionate and discriminatory stopping of blacks and Hispanics in violation of the Equal Protection Clause. Now, not surprisingly, New York City's mayor and police chief were taken aback. Mayor Michael Bloomberg is vowing to appeal the ruling. We know that most of those lives saved, based on the statistics, have been black and Hispanic young men. If murder rates over the last 11 years had been the same as the previous 11 years, more than 7,300 people who are alive today would be dead. There were more stops for suspicious activity in neighborhoods with higher crime because that's where the crime is. A few facts about New York City's stop and frisk policy. According to Dennis Smith, a professor of public policy at New York University who consults for the NYPD, in 1990, New York had 527,257 victims of serious crimes. In 2011, there were 106,064. In 1990, he says, 2,262 murders. In 2011, 504 murders. But here's some more information that factored into yesterday's ruling. From 2004 to mid-2012, 4.4 million people were stopped. In 2011 and 2012, 87 percent of those stopped were black or Latino. In 2011, only 12 percent were actually charged with crimes. I want to bring in Brooklyn City Councilman Jamani Williams, who says he's been personally affected by this policy. We did ask for a representative from the mayor's office uh, to join us in this discussion, uh, but they declined. Councilman, thanks for joining us. You were walking around at a parade in Brooklyn in 2011. Explain what happened next. Uh, well, thanks for having me. Um, as you mentioned, uh, myself and Kirsten John Ford, he was an aide uh, to public advocate Bill de Basile, were trying to go into uh, an event we were invited to and found ourselves handcuffed and arrested, uh, primarily, we believe, because of how we looked and people didn't believe we were who we said we were. And I'm also not surprised that the mayor uh, and no one uh, decided to decline to speak because they can't back up their numbers. So they play fuzzy math when it comes to the numbers and like to pretend uh, in large chunks that they've done things. But what they don't tell you is the largest decline in that murder rate happened even before the mayor came into office. And if you look at their own CompStat numbers, there is absolutely no correlation at all between the increased number of stops, uh, more guns on the street, less shootings, period. But so what do you attribute the fact that there has been this notable drop in murder and serious crime since the 90s? You you think that stop and frisk is not the reason for it. Uh, then then what is? Well, we know it's not the reason for it. That's one. And two, we know that the way they've been doing it, not the stop and frisk, but the profiling is unconstitutional, unconstitutional. The largest drop happened between 90 and 98 when we had the least amount of stops. And then again, right before the mayor came into office, and in, in 2003, where there was 160 some odd stops, there were 597 murders. Uh, but in, uh, in other years, uh, 2006, that murder rate went up, and such and so forth. And if you look at these numbers, really you'll see there are years where we had less stops and we had also less shootings. If you look at the past six months, where Everything is down, murder rate, shootings, and stops. So we attribute it to good police work, like Operation Crew Cut, like Impact Zones, to good community work, like Man Up Inc., YSOS, uh, that are doing violence interruptions, and community involvement, and funding going to places that we need. I co-chair the Gun Violence Task Force on the City Council. We've infused some of these higher crime areas with resources. And those things together have been doing uh, what the mayor is trying to claim has been done with stop and frisk. And every time you ask them to show you the numbers, they can't. And they play fuzzy math with people who can't talk back. Councilman, we only have a little bit of time, so just very, very briefly, one explanation I read as to why this policy works is because you have individuals in high crime areas 
which for a whole bunch of socioeconomic reasons we don't have to get into right now, uh, are often uh, minority neighborhoods. Uh, and when you are stopping and frisking people uh, all the time who look suspicious, uh, people who would carry guns tend to not carry them anymore. And I've heard anecdotally the police say that some of these guns uh, for gangs and, and other groups, uh, they have community areas where they stash these guns, but they're not walking around with guns. Uh, hence, the crime rate, the shooting rate has been reduced. You're saying that's just not true? It's, it's just false. Uh, one, again, the murder rate was slashed long before the mayor uh, came into office. And two, uh, if you look at their own stats, only 16% of people have been stopped for um, descriptions. And if you can pretend that the, violating the Constitution was okay, you can look at there are areas in the city that are not high crime areas. And still in those areas, they're still stopping black and Hispanics. And lastly, you have, in many years, were more likely to get a gun or a weapon off of someone who was white who was stopped. And still they decided to stop more on black Latinos. All right, no so matter how you slice this up, it doesn't work. And fortunately, we have an arrogant mayor that instead of coming to the table, now has a federal monitor. Now has a Community Safety Act on the New York City Council. We've got to wrap it up there, sir. Except there's a problem. We have but to wrap it up. You. City Councilman Jamani Williams, thank you.